Good morning, once again. It's so good to have you here. How many of you are glad that you made it or you're online now watching us? Really appreciate you making a special effort to be with us today. Uh, today's the first Sunday of the month. It's uh, March the 3rd already, and that means it's our Communion Sunday, something that we do from month to month. And the reason that we share communion on a regular basis is because Jesus asked us to. He said to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. And with Christianity, whenever we remember his death, it also compels us to think about his life. Jesus wanted us to recall his sacrifice on the cross. He wanted us to remember the great love that he has for us, that love that drove him to the cross, but he also wanted us to remember his instructions and to live out those instructions each and every day of our lives. And so over the next couple of weeks, leading up to the Easter season and beyond, we're going to remember what Jesus did for us, all that he did for us, uh, including his death, burial, and resurrection. So this is the Easter season, it's time, and so I'm looking forward to that, and I'm sure you are as well. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I'd like to begin by sharing one verse of scripture found in the book of John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 5 and verse 17. John 5, 17, Jesus is talking, and the scripture says, Jesus replied, my father, that's God the father, is always working, and so am I. One more time, my father is always working, and so am I. The amplified version says, my father has been working until now, he has never ceased or stopped working. Now, how many of you have read that verse of Scripture in the Bible or have heard a pastor or a Bible teacher talk about it? You should say yes because you should be reading your Bible or taking Bible study from time to time. It's the absolute truth. God is always at work. And I could go through the Bible and list hundreds of Bible verses that confirm that. Here at our church, we love to sing the song, Waymaker. Remember that one? He's the waymaker. He's the miracle worker, the promise keeper. In the middle of the song, there's lyrics that say, even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. That's our God. He's always at work. He's always involved in our lives. One of the names assigned to Jesus was Emmanuel. Remember that? God with us. God is actively involved in the lives of his people. And so if that's the case, if Jesus was telling the truth and said God is always at work, the Father is always working, he hasn't stopped working, if God continually rolls up his sleeves, not afraid to get his hands dirty, even when we mess things up, here's my question for you this morning. What's he doing? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are kidding. <laughs> yeah, he's working. But what's his main concentration? What is God all about? All right, well, there's a couple of things, okay? A couple of assignments or projects that God is currently working on, and i like to try to answer those questions for you this morning. Now, is God doing more than what I'm going to mention? Absolutely. In fact, I don't think we could possibly list all of the work that God's involved in. His plate is full. He's nonstop going at it. But for the purpose of this message this morning, I'd like to just give you two assignments or two activities that God is currently involved in. Are you ready for that? All right, two projects that God works at all the time. Number one, God the Father is busy getting people saved. He's busy getting lost people saved. How many of you know God has a huge and heavy heart for the unsaved? He really does. The Bible tells us 
that he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to get saved. Emphasis being everyone. In fact, that's the reason why Jesus came to planet Earth in the first place. The scripture said he came to save us. Jesus came to save us. Last time I checked, that's what a Savior does. A Savior saves. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul the Apostle said this. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Do you know what full acceptance means? It means to acknowledge it all as truth. Paul said, here's a trustworthy saying. I want you to embrace. I want you to believe it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul says, when you look at everybody in the world, the number one heathen that you would find on the planet is me. I am the absolute worst sinner. But, Paul said, for that very reason was I shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. Please note, not just his patience, his enormous, gigantic, massive patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul basically said, if God, would have enough patience and mercy and kindness and grace and everything else to get my attention and turn my life around, then he could do the very same thing for anyone else. 2 Peter 3.9 says it this way, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he, God, is patient there's that patience word again he's patience with you and he's patience patient with me not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance friend this is huge over and over again in the scripture we're reminded that our loving god desires for everyone to get saved for everyone to come to repentance, not just a handful of people, not just an, an elect or select few. He desires for all of us to come to know him. Do you know what it means to come to repentance when a scripture uses that phrase? It means to actually feel the heaviness and weight of your sin so much so that you acknowledge you can't do anything about it yourself. You can't change who you are. You can't make it any better. You can't recover from your faults and failures. So what you do is you turn away from your sin. You do that on purpose. You make a choice to turn away from your sin and turn to God, and you open your heart to his forgiveness and his grace. You see, something very dramatic and divine happens deep down in our soul when our human guilt and shame and unworthiness is consumed by God's grace. Yeah. Friends, something happens. And the unconditional love of God changes everything. It makes a huge difference in our lives. And we read about this in the Word of God. The Scripture gives us pictures for us to look at and in the gospel of luke we get a bird's eye view of this unconditional love that i'm talking about luke chapter 15 gives us this great picture of the heart of god in luke 15 jesus tells three of his more famous stories in the entire new testament and he doesn't come up for air until he completes all three. In each of these three stories, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, also known as the prodigal son, in each of these three stories, something comes up missing. And what was gone mattered greatly to the person who lost it. 
In the first story with the shepherd, we're told that he lost one of his sheep, even though he had 99 other sheep to be concerned about. He had 99 sheep to, to watch over and to protect and to care for. Still, he was very concerned about that one little lamb that he lost. And what did he do? He went on a diligent search for that sheep. In fact, he left the entire flock behind to try and find it. And once he laid eyes on that sheep that had been lost, even though it had caused problems for him, even though it had strayed on, it, on its own, he lovingly and gently picked up that sheep, laid it across his shoulders, went running to all of his family members and friends and neighbors and said what? Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. So excited was the shepherd when he found just one sheep. The second story involves a woman who had 10 silver coins. And according to Jewish tradition, these 10 coins were uh, very significant because they represented a gift from her husband. 10 silver coins that communicated to this woman her, his great love for her. And so every day she'd pull out that napkin that had those 10 coins in it and she'd count them out. One, two, three, all the way to 10. She'd do that every day. Well, one day she took the coins out, she counted them, there were only nine. She counted again, nine. Counted a third time, nine. And when she discovered that she had lost one of her silver coins, she did pretty much the same thing that you and I do when we lose our keys or our cell phone. She tore the house upside down and didn't leave one item unturned until she found it. Finally, when that spoiled brat of a son demanded a share of his inheritance and left home, his father's heart was broken. It crushed his dad. His dad was devastated. But every day, the scripture tells us, from sunup to sundown, this father looked out into the distant horizon, waiting for his son to return. And he didn't rest, and he didn't eat well, and he didn't sleep until he saw the silhouette of his son. And at his homecoming, he ran out to greet him, and he put his arms around him, and he celebrated his return, and he treated him like royalty. This is our God, friends. These three stories that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15 convey to us the kind of God that we serve and how much he loves us. Unlike the scribes and the Pharisees who loathed and disdained the sinners who could care less about people who were far from God, God works overtime trying to get our attention. He does not stop, not even with the most hardened heart. Paul said he was the worst sinner. God never stopped working with Paul. He continued to pursue him, even when we reject him, when we brazenly disregard his invitation for us to come and receive the best that he has. Still, he's working in our lives. In fact, in another place in the scripture, when talking about patience, the scripture tells us that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't kick the door down. He doesn't even walk through the door. He could. He's done that in the past too. He just patiently stands there knocking, and sometimes he knocks for a long, long time. In addition to that continual knocking at the door of our heart, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, waiting patiently for us, ever lives to make intercession for us. Did you know that? Did you know that every single day Jesus is praying for you? He's praying for your family, he's praying for your loved ones, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. It's true, doing it right now, right here, today. And if you haven't made the decision yet, 
every single day, Jesus is interceding on behalf of your salvation. So, number one, the Father is always at work. Jesus said so in John 5, 17. And number two, he's, so he's at work trying desperately to get lost people saved. And then number two, he's pretty busy getting saved people sanctified. And now that's for all of us. Okay? So there's a group of people that haven't yet made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. They would be what we would call spiritually lost. God is at work trying to get those lost people saved. Secondly, he's busy getting saved people sanctified. And a good working definition for the word sanctified is set apart for God's purpose. Can I get you to say that? Set apart for God's purpose. For our purpose? No, for God's purpose. Set apart for God's purpose. See, here's the problem with Christianity today. From my perspective. People respond to the gospel message. Maybe they hear a, a, a message or maybe they are moved emotionally or, or, or they say the sinner's prayer and, and they lock into the unconditional love of God and they get a revelation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so they make a decision and they take a step toward God. But then, instead of going to the next level, which is full surrender to God, what they basically do is just add salvation to their own way of life. They just keep living the same way, but now they're saved. Now they're a Christian. So that's really not sanctification, that's salvation. Now when we say that, when, when somebody responds to a sinner's prayer, when, when somebody says, okay, I want to be a Christian, uh, does that count? Well, yeah, it counts. Uh, when they say, I want to be a Christian, they bow their knee at the cross, are their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Yeah, absolutely. Will they spend an eternity with the Lord forever and ever and have that promise of eternal life when this life is over? Yes, they will. However, instead of living a life that is set apart, a life that is designated to be devoted to God as a fully devoted follower of Christ, which is really ultimately the goal, they just keep doing their own thing. They just keep living life the same way they had been, only now they're saved. That's not sanctification. So God is busy trying to get us, move us from being saved to being sanctified. Again, we have many verses in the Bible that tell us this. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, same Paul who said he was a sinner, he wrote this. He said, for God is what? He's working in the world. He's working in you. He's working in me. What is God doing? He's giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases you. Oh no, to do what pleases him. Of course, I'm kidding. God gives us the grace. He gives us the power to do his will, to be concerned about what he wants from us. That is sanctification. That's being set apart. In Psalm chapter, or in Psalm 86, 11, Paul appeal, uh, uh, David appeals to God. Psalm 86, 11. David said, Lord, teach me your way. Teach me your way. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear or reverence your name. The same verse in the Good News Bible says it this way, teach me, Lord, what you want me to do, and I will obey you faithfully. Teach me to serve you with complete devotion. That's what it means to have an undivided heart. Friend, this should be the greatest prayer that we pray every single morning. When we get up in the morning and we face our day and we thank God that he's given us a new day and that we have 
breath in our lungs and we're, and we're healthy and we have blessing, the very first words out of our mouth should be what David prayed here in Psalm 86. Lord, teach me, show me, reveal to me what it is you want me to do. That's what it means to have an undivided heart. We have so many in the church today whose hearts are divided because we're saved, but we haven't learned the sanctification process just yet. And I'll be the first to admit, this is a hefty assignment to pray that kind of a prayer. It's a tall order to go after God's will for our lives because we live in a culture that is determined to stunt and impede our spiritual growth. Everywhere we turn, there is something there to keep us from pursuing God. I mean, every time we take a step toward God, I guarantee the enemy is going to counter that uh, progress with his own move. The devil doesn't like you making strides in your faith. He doesn't like you moving from salvation to sanctification or growing in grace. And so he is going to prevent that or attempt to prevent that from happening. That's why we are instructed to put on the full armor of God each and every day. Not three times a week, or over the weekend, every day. Because the weapons of our warfare, they're what? They're mighty. They're not carnal, they're not worldly, they're powerful to the pulling down of strongholds. We have been given mighty weapons of warfare to help us. Now, a few weeks back, during the prayer and fasting time, I felt like the Lord gave me a little direction for the new year, for 2024. And I made this statement during our prayer and fasting time. Some of you remember it, because you quoted it back to me. I said, God wants our passion to please him, to exceed our passion for fleshly desires. This is what God is asking us to do this year, that our passion to please him, our passion to know his will, and to walk in his will for our lives, he wants that to be greater than our fleshly desires. How many know the devil wants the exact opposite for you? He doesn't want you walking in the spirit or staying in step with the Spirit. He wants you to live according to the flesh, where you have a divided heart, where everything moves you and you're tossed to and fro every single time something bad comes your way. And so we have this ongoing battle. It's a daily battle. We face it constantly over and over again, this choice to pursue God and to do God's will or to allow the enemy to influence us with fleshly desires. And if we're going to be saved Christians that become sanctified Christians, we have to win this battle. Amen. So God is at work. Jesus said it in John 5, 17. He's always at work. He hasn't stopped working. He's desperately trying to get lost people saved and he's trying to get saved people sanctified. It's what God does. All right, one final passage, and then we'll make our way to the communion table. This passage is found in the book of Micah. It's very familiar to probably everyone here, if not most of you. Micah 6, 8. Here's what it says. He, God, has shown you, listen, he has shown you, man and woman, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, not to enforce justice, there's a big difference. He's asking you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. One more time. What does the Lord require of you? Not just me, you. He wants you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Don't look now, but I don't think I can come up with a more accurate illustration or definition of what it means to be sanctified. This one verse pretty much says it all. And wherever you look in the Bible, wherever you see a picture or an interpretation of God, especially 
in the New Testament with the person of Jesus Christ, you will see these three attributes in operation. Justice, mercy, and humility. You can't go anywhere in the Bible. You can't find one single verse of Scripture where God is acting unjust, merciless, or arrogant. I challenge you to find one place in the Bible where you will see that. The Bible tells us that God is good. In every way, God is good. That evil can't even tempt God. He can't be tempted with evil. He's flawless. He's perfect in all of his ways. That means it would be impossible for God to act in any other way than with justice, mercy, and humility. And please note, the scripture wasn't just talking to us about God's great attributes. No, it was an invitation for us to join him, right? And, and what was the requirement? And, and again, it wasn't a suggestion or a proposal or a recommendation. It was a requirement that God gave to us. And that word require in the Hebrew is the word dorash, D-O-R-E-S-H. It's where we get our English word demand. So it's not a suggestion, it is a demand that God is asking us to do. It's a requirement, it's an order, it's a command. And please note that there's no way in the world that we could possibly fulfill this requirement or this demand by ourselves. The only way that we could is by paying close attention to the last three words. Do you remember them? With your God. We forget about that. We focus in on the justice, the mercy, and the humility, and we forget about the part that says, with your God. We are to act justly with our God. We are to love mercy with our God. And we're to walk humbly with our God. There's no other way to do it. But see, with his help, with us asking and seeking and appealing before his throne, Lord, not my will, but your will. Lord, show me. Lord, teach me. Reveal to me. With that kind of attitude, Philippians 4.13 tells us we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Second Peter says that we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians 4.13 says we can be established in the faith built up in him until we all reach spiritual maturity. You see, sanctification is not way out there. It's not like there's no way we can attain it. We can, but we have to do it with our God. So whatever it is that the Lord is asking us to do, whenever he sets something out in his word and he says, this is what I'd like you to try and, and do and this is the place I'd like you to get to, it's always with the understanding that he is there with us, working with us, never stopping, not to this very day. So, is God at work? Yes. He is. What's he doing? Well, he's trying to get lost people saved, and he's trying to get people like you and me that are saved sanctified. Okay. Let's, pre let's uh, begin to prepare our hearts for communion. The scripture says it was on the night Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. After giving thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper had ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He passed the cup to his disciples. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. 
On two different occasions when Jesus instituted the communion supper, he asked his disciples to do it in remembrance of him. Why did Jesus ask his disciples to remember him? Because he wanted them to continually remember everything that he had done for them. Not only his sacrifice on the cross, but everything that he had taught them. He was hoping that the Holy Spirit would bring back to their remembrance all of the teachings, all of the illustrations, the miracles, the times that they had spent alone together. He was praying and hoping that they would remember those things. See, as believers, as saved believers, the best that we can do is join God in his work. If God is working, as his church, we should be working as well. We should be involved in the very things that God is involved in. And we should allow our memory of Jesus' sacrifice to increase our own desire for justice and mercy and humility. These things don't just happen, friend. You're not going to wake up one morning and you're going to be more humble. You're going to need to be put in situations that bring humility. You're not going to wake up one morning and all of a sudden you're going to be committed to justice. You're going to have to go through some paces and some experiences and remember what Jesus did in order for these things to be worked into our lives. And what happens is the more that we grow in grace, the more that we allow the Lord to work in our lives, the more that we move from being saved Christians to sanctified Christians, the more compassion we have, the more we take on the character of God. And then you know what our heart's desire is? for lost people to be saved and for saved people to be sanctified. That's what God wants from us. You know, I, I look on social media sometimes and I see people's reaction to insects and to birds, not even cats and dogs. That's one thing. I mean, God forbid that anybody would ever harm a cat or a dog, but talk about an insect. We get more concerned over the mistreatment of a fly than we do somebody who needs the love of God. Something's got to change here. Something has to put in our hearts the same grief that's in the heart of the Father when someone is lost and far from him. It has to happen. It's ha it happens as we move from that place of being saved to that place of being sanctified. You know, one month ago uh, in February, uh, so last month uh, for our communion service, I was told that three young men walked into our church for the very first time. When he came into the lobby, one of our greeters noticed them. He noticed that they were brand new. He had never seen them before. And he also noticed that they looked pretty rough around the edges. People that were not used to being in church. So our greeter walked up to these three guys. He introduced himself. He met them, found out each of their names. They told him that they were here for the first time. They asked to be seated. He seated them and then just felt prompted by the Lord to hang out with them. So he stayed close by and all during the worship time, he felt himself praying for them. It was just something the Lord was doing in his heart. And toward the end of that service, I don't know if you remember, we talked about um, you know, loving the one in the mirror. I believe that particular uh, message was about our need for safety and security. I quoted Romans chapter 
8 and verse 1, which says we have, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that message? I, I, I made a big deal about how God forgives us and how much he loves us. And at the end of the service, during the communion time, I had a call for salvation. And I, I, I asked if there's anyone who wanted to surrender their life to God and, and repent of their sins and make a commitment to raise their hand. And hands went up to all over the congregation. And this greeter friend of mine told me with tears and strong emotion, he watched those three young men all raise their hand for salvation at the end. See, God's at work today. Jesus said he's never stopped working. He's at work saving lives, bringing people to the place of salvation. He's doing it today. He's involved in it today. He's at work in your life right now. If you haven't made that commitment yet, if you already have and you're struggling with something, he's moving you to that place of being set apart in him. God is at work. He doesn't stop. Never. I'm wondering if you might be here this morning. Can I get you to bow your head for a minute? If you're here this morning or maybe you're listening to me watching online and you know you're not in the place where you need to be right now spiritually maybe you've never made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ or maybe you have in months past or years past and but you're st you strayed you're, you're not where you should be and you've been desperately trying to get back to the place of serving God and blessing God. I want you to know somebody has been praying for you. Someone who loves you, not someone who's trying to make you live the way they live. Somebody who cares about you. They care about your soul. Because over the last couple of weeks, whenever we've come to church, the presence of the Lord has been so strong. I know that God is putting this desire in our hearts to see people get saved today. If that's you, don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. If you have felt the Lord knocking at the door of your heart, I'm going to appeal to you. Do not turn him away today. Don't turn God away today. If you'd like to take a step toward God, and you know what I'm talking about, and you want to do it this morning, can I get you to just raise your hand? Just lift it up. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Father, you're so good to us. You sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Your word says that he came to save us, to save us from our sins. And Lord, we're all the same here no exceptions. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And I thank you, Lord, for those who've raised their hand today. Don't know their situation. I don't know if they're making a commitment to you for the first time or they're on their road back to you, Lord, but I pray that something dramatic would take place in our heart today as your grace and your mercy and your love consumes that human guilt that plagues us. Thank you for being in the business of saving lives and sanctifying your saints. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you made on the cross, for your body that was broken, that ours wouldn't have to be. Lord, you took a tremendous beating for our healing. Your word says that by your wounds we're healed. I pray, Lord, for every person in this place who's struggling right now with a need of some kind, physical need, Lord, medical need, for those who are afraid, alone, full of anxiety and stress, Lord, those who need a paycheck coming from somewhere. Lord, you're the God who not only heals us, but you provide for us. You are a providing God. Thank you for your body being broken for our redemption and our salvation. Thank you for shedding your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for being at work, Lord, in each of our lives. 
we take this communion bread and cup together, Lord. We remember everything that you did for us. We thank you for your instruction to do this in remembrance of you. Let's take the bread and the cup together.